All right, so yeah, also welcome from my side. So I will talk about our information center together team Middleware Overlay VSL. And uh, for those of you who participated yesterday know already what VSL stands for, namely for virtual state layer, why it's named like that, I will tell you in a second. Um, here you see some of the uh, papers that we have for this middleware. So it started already back in 2009. And uh, the main purpose why I show you this is First of all, there's much more than I can tell you about everything. And second, what the path was of the development. So it started with context modeling, then security became recently much more important with anomaly detection, service discovery, service management, and also caching our topics that we are currently going into with our research. Okay, good. This said, um, in a nutshell, what do we do? So we still want to enable that you can create applications for cohesive computing using Internet of Things devices as you can do for the smartphones that we have here. And with our virtual state layer middleware, we introduce an additional layer to this setting. So this is the typical setting that you have today with IoT applications. So you have some users that use some devices to configure their IoT. Then you have some services that do automation. You have some services that interface the actual devices. So these services here could also be actually running on the devices. And then these devices are interfacing the environment. And what we do with our middleware is that we introduce another layer. And this is the green layer here. And in this green layer, we exactly hold this virtual state. And the virtual state is a representation of all the properties from the physical world, but also from the software world um, that is relevant in order to orchestrate such spaces. And what could be relevant from the software world here, so there you can think for instance about weather forecasts that are coming through the internet, so this is a software service that would also be relevant for applications in here to create complex IoT orchestration scenarios. And our end goal is that we have crowdsourced software development, so people are able to develop some software here which implements complex functionality by reusing existing components, which facilitates the entire task. Okay, good. So, um, information-centric, so why did we name the title information-centric middleware overlay? Well, there are some parallels between the change from a traditional internet architecture towards an information-centric <coughs> one with the IoT, and I briefly want to show you some dimensions of that which are at the same time the structure of my talk. So first of all, the API. So on the left side here, you always see what the internet today has as API, <coughs> and you see what a typical ICM has as API. So I will not go into detail here, but it sh uh, should be clear there. Um, data structuring, some aspect, data placement, data discovery, data transformation. So by this one, I mean, if you have some data, and especially in the IoT, you might need it in another format if there's a possibility to do so. Um, separation of data production and delivery, which is an important aspect of our middleware. And last but not least, from my perspective, the most important one, security. Okay, so with the IoT, I will go a little bit more in detail, so these are more the dimensions now. So um, with the IoT, you typically have today an addressing that is similar to today's internet. So you use a device address and then a data path there. With us, we use a data ID to access, so similar to the ICN paradigm on the left here. The data structuring is central to our approach. So there we use a hierarchically structure of tagged nodes. Then data placement in traditional IoT is typically at the data source or sync. So it's at the outside of the network. And in our case, it's in the middle of the network, so it's in our middleware. Then the discovery is typically happening either pre-configured with static links <coughs> or distributed, so you walk through all the devices and have a distributed discovery. In our case, it's node local in our middleware component. Data transformation. In today's IoT, you typically don't have it, so this is exactly one of the major problems. So you have heterogeneous interfaces and also heterogeneous data and in order to process it you have to unify it in some way so that you can use it. With this you can easily create that in network. I'll briefly go to that also later. 
separation of production and delivery of data um, in the traditional IoT, you typically don't have it. With us, this is a fundamental principle, which brings lots of advantages, especially regarding security, because um, when we are maintaining the data, which happens through this mechanism here, then we can implement all security primitives that we want to implement. So called by design, meaning it's non-circumventable by those implementing the applications. Okay, so now we'll go through the different parts here and I'll show you a little bit more details. Okay, but first of all, a system architecture overview. So here we will first show you which are the components and what is their purpose, and then we'll go in detail to certain aspects of that. Okay, so um, we see that we see many things. So let's start from the bottom. So at the bottom we have the physical hardware, and we especially have compute nodes. So these are the compute nodes where services can run, and where also hardware sensor and actuator hardware is connected. And on this hardware, we have our middleware components, the so-called knowledge agents. So they're called knowledge agents because they maintain the knowledge. So these data structures, we have them running. And so the matching is that for all nodes that are powerful enough, we have one of these knowledge agents running and they are then a self-managing peer-to-peer system. So they discover each other, they create an overlay and enable therefore, um, for instance, location transparency. So that means when you talk to one of these agents, you have access to all the information that is stored in all the distributed agents that we have there. We jump, briefly jump over this one, go to this one here. So on top, we have the layer with the services. So this is where either your devices, your IoT devices are interfaced. So these are an adaptation or gateway services or you can do other tasks. So this is just one classification, but it helps to understand what tasks or services in such a middleware it could be. You could do advanced reasoning, meaning you take some data items and transform them into other data items that you offer again. You can do orchestration, which is mainly you control some of the devices based on input that you get. And you can have user interfaces, which is the equivalent to this one, but this one has a user interface. It could be your smartphone, for instance. So those of you who have visited the demo, so there the user interface should be um, Android app is for instance one of these user interface services. Um, and then these services connect to one of the middleware components here, so one of the peer-to-peer -peer knowledge agents. So there's always a one-to-one -one relation, so they don't have to run on the same node, but it makes sense because then the connection is faster and they interact with the other ones by accessing their data. And one key point in a peer-to-peer -peer system and also in an information-centric network is how to discover the data of the other services. And this is exactly happening through the search providers here. And as a built-in search primitive, we have so-called data type tags. And these are functional tags. So you can say, for instance, that one of these data nodes is of a type um, light switch and then when you want to switch all lights in a building, you can discover them based on this mechanism here. Um, the good thing is this system can be extended very easily. So you can very easily link in also other search providers here, like location search or owner search. And this is very powerful and very helpful to create complex IoT applications. Okay, so briefly to the right side. So this is what is inside such a component. So we have functionality to maintain the overlay, so the connectivity between those here. Then we can uh, process the messages that are exchanged between the services and between these here. And then as the biggest part, we have the repository where the data nodes are stored. As external component here, we have the context model repository and the context model repository. This is where the data structures that we will see in a second are stored. And from there, they are then instantiated into the distributed spaces. We call all this here is typically running site locally. And so it does not have to, it could also run globally or in the cloud. But in order to keep my data private, our target scenario are site local installations, where you can then have explicit interfaces to the outside world through those services, which enables you to control the security properties. Okay, good. 
So this is the guiding example that I used through the talk. This is the setup of the demo that you might have seen there. We will also still have the time to look at today if you want. So we have different IoT hardware here and some interfaces. And the important thing now when you want to create applications for that is which is the information that's relevant for the setting. This is what I put here in green. And then you need some services that offer you this information. So this is what you always do when you create an IoT <coughs> application for this. And so now we have compute nodes and we have some services interfacing those things. And the new thing is now that we introduce these middleware components that are running on each of the compute nodes. And on these, we have the data representations that are structured as trees in here and also in here. And these nodes here are exactly representing the properties that we have here on the left. And the, the main purpose of the services is always reflecting between the virtual representation that we have in here and the physical state of the actual smart space around. Those components are connected, as I said before. Okay, and so we have the overview. And what we have now is we use the hierarchically structured nodes here as interfaces to access the different services, which is a little bit different from looking for functions and invoking these functions directly. But it's quite comfortable and it doesn't bring drawbacks regarding the things that you can implement. And they access each other over the overlay, so this is this part as shown before. Okay. Good. So what is the API? So the API is we have normal get set, so we have asynchronous coupling using data IDs. And so here you see in the time sequence diagram, we have a service, the service is connected to its middleware component, and if it wants to retrieve data from another compute node where another middleware component is running, mm -hmm. then it's only accessing its local component. The local component is then accessing the remote component, getting the data and returning it here. So that means all connections are always terminating at this first component here. Everything that happens behind it could also be more hops um, is hidden by the abstraction here. Of course, you see it through the latency. Okay. The second coupling mechanism are the subscribes here, so it's a publish subscribe interaction scheme, so you can subscribe on changes, and if someone changes something in the data structure, you get a notification. And the third one is the most interesting one, so it's a so-called virtual node, and while these things here, as you see, even though these two services interact, the communication terminates already at this component, which is also good because you can also disable this component or put it into power safe mode, the virtual nodes are terminating within the second service. And so they enable fully synchronous communication and they also enable stream communication, which you might need for certain applications in there. Okay, next important point, structured data. So as said already, we have these data nodes here, they are hierarchically structured, they represent the properties and the first node below the root here, this is always the service node. And so each of these services implements the reflection functionality for the properties that are around. Okay. Putting it a little bit more technical here. So each of these knowledge agents has then such a tree. And in the tree we have the services. And the services have these different nodes. But the structures are not created ad hoc. Like, okay, I need some more nodes at the moment. But we have a central repository. This was the component in the beginning shown at the right here. And from this central repository, these patterns here are loaded in here. And why is it important? Because these are the abstract interfaces for the services. So you could imagine that this one is implementing a light here, and then it's instantiated here, and then it could have additional properties. And the good thing is when you do service discovery, you can not only discover the whole structure here, but you can also discover all substructures, which is quite powerful. Okay, naming, placement, caching. So our naming, as I said before, we have a source service ID, which also corresponds, corresponds to the location here, but this is just for debugging purpose. It could also be something totally different. And then we have a data path, which is from the root node of the service to the leaf node that you want to access. The placement at the moment is at the source, 
KA, so the first one that you're directly connected to. And the <coughs> only reason for that is that we can have strong consistency on write with that because you can only access the data at one point. But you could also do caching, and this is why I wrote here. Caching is possible and well prepared, so it's, everything is working for caching, but the write consistency is currently a challenge that we are looking at. Okay. Good. So, um, yeah, here another example. So this is an access to a regular node, so it terminates here, as you see. And this is an access to a virtual node, so it terminates directly in the service. And as you see, so these are the actual commands that you have to put as a developer. So for you, it's all transparent in here. Okay, let's come <coughs> to the data discovery. So the data discovery works as follows. So it enables late binding. So you don't directly access the target address that you have here, but instead you first do the lookup using these tags that I was talking about before. So here's such a tag, for instance, and as return, you get then all instances that implement this data model, and then you can access those. And this enables you to change the topology here and still being able to use all the things. It also enables you to create services that can in the future access things that went, were not there when the service was first started. So when someone introduces additional light switches and you have a service that searches for all light switches, it will automatically work. Okay. Good. In network data transformation, I'm just briefly going to that. So a property of the middleware here is that it's very easy to search service cascades and then you can do nice things like transforming information from a sensor reading to the sun is shining, introducing some more sensor fusion to make me I am happy. However, this is magically done. Okay. And then I come already to the last point, which is security. And for the security, I want to give you a brief overview. Um, there are more details of all in the other publications. So here you see um, the entire envisioned service ecosystem. So we have developers here, and we have a global store, and then we have the local site. And within this local site, we have a hierarchical management, meaning we have a site local <coughs> head, which is the site local service manager. And then on each of these nodes, we have a node local service managers that do the node local management, because you have to bear in mind that the, all these nodes here are typically unattended. So they are inside your wall, and you don't have a display, so it's not like your smartphone. And therefore, also, the service management is quite challenging, because you have to make sure that you can mitigate automatically from failures that you might have on updates, for instance. So the security scheme works now like that. So you have an executable, in our case, the prototype is in Java. It has some metadata, then we introduce a certificate that we ping to both here using hashes. And then the developer is signing this, sending it to the store. The store is validating it. It's then adding another certificate that is signed by the store, which is the global trust anchor. Then it's shipped to the local site. And then the most interesting part comes, namely in the local site, we have a site local certificate authority. So we do site local signing, and this has the purpose that these nodes do not necessarily have to be connected and if they are not connected they still have the need for knowing that they belong to the same site and as all these use the same certificate authority as trust anchor they can know okay the certificate was actually really issued inside this space and we can use it here a second reason is that for enabling distributed revocation here we use short lifetime certificates that are automatically managed so they are auto-renewed um, my free date uh, every day at the moment. Okay, and user can also change some rights here. Um, for more details, we can discuss it offline afterwards. Okay, and last point, briefly evaluation. So um, first thing that you can also see in the demo, on the right we see some pseudocode for some orchestration task, and on the left in the demo this is animated, we see the calls in the middleware here, and we see that it's very close. And as this is supposed to be very simple to be created, you see that using this middleware is, makes it very simple to implement complex IoT tasks. We also <coughs> continuously evaluate that, so we have more than 100 pilot <coughs> students so far that rated the difficulty quite good here, so it was quite easy. And that are also, which is maybe even more important, very fast in implementing the tasks. So they are between 240 and 480 minutes. And so there's one really comparable related work that we looked at at least 
and there it was more than 250 hours, which is quite good comparison. Then the second is the latency. So this is the latency when you do coupling on the same node. This is the latency, latency when you have a remote node here. And in the demo, you can also see the current latencies for the excesses. And this is the scalability. So here we have 1,500 consecutive requests from that many clients. And we see that with the increased number of clients, it decreases, but it does not decrease like this. So it seems to scale quite OK our pilot implementation even though it's only evaluating, of course, the implementation. So the concept would, in another programming language, probably scale even better. Bringing me to the last slide, so we looked at the different aspects here. Um, so the API data structure and data placement, discovery, data transformation, separation of data production and delivery, and security. You can see most properties also in the demo that we still kept running today. So today is the last chance for looking at the demo. and. Thank you for listening. Uh, Michel Barbeau from Carleton University. Um, I saw you have uh, good security in your system. And um, I was wondering uh, if you feel uh, that uh, uh, your security is complete or there are still gaps uh, or open doors that need to be addressed. Uh, for instance, uh, there's an area of research called cyber physical security and uh, it's like it's like another world like uh, compared to classical security and uh, do you feel need there's a need for, for things like that or uh... yeah thank you very much Michel for the question so um, what, what we try to secure here is the basic security that we can provide for these services, meaning we have basic, basic access control on a, well, it's fine granular compared to nothing, but it's coarse granular compared to really going into detailed security here. And therefore, one aspect we're currently looking at is also how can we locally set more preferences so that the access control scheme here gets more fine granular. But coming to your actual question, so this security here ends at the service that is running here. And you, what you were referring to, I guess, is also that then you have the IoT devices or the industry automation devices that are running in the field there. And um, first of all, you have to make sure that the connection to them is secured. And second, referring to the cyber physical systems, things like malfunctions or attacks that go beyond the system because it always has to be connected to the end device these are of course not covered by that yet and um, the good thing is that once we have methods to do so it's quite easy to plug them in and then we could extend this system for specialized security that is related to these aspects and um, one thing that we are also doing <coughs> regarding this is we're doing black box analysis of such iot devices we try to model them and then we try to do anomaly detection and this helps to a certain extent but of course not to actual manipulations at the hardware. Oh, thank you. Okay. Any other question? So I have a question uh, because it's an IT system and often we have some requirements for the link between devices. Can you provide some quality of service guarantees or some reservations? So, um, good, good question, thank you. So the system I was presenting is running not on the field level, so it's not running on the resource constrained IoT devices, but it's running on top of it in the management layer. And so our current implementation is built up on um, TCP and IP, so this is what we use as underlay, but we could easily switch that because we're fully encapsulated. And the quality of service, we can guarantee the quality of service within the application layer because there we can prioritize the messages that we have. But for everything beyond, we rely on the, on the underlay, of course. And so there, if the underlay is providing us some quality of service, we could use it. So far, we're not doing that. Um, but if it does not, we cannot. And so it was not yet in our focus, but you're totally right, especially when you want to go towards more real time and you want to have boundaries there, it's necessary to have it. Yeah. Thanks.
Okay, if no further question, let's thank all the speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, the session ends here. Thank you very much. Let's have a coffee break.